the first example we will formulate is in your textbook. It's called uh, RMC problem. The problem statement is given here. I would like you to pause now and read the problem first. Okay, are you ready? When you first start on a problem, it's a good idea to summarize the given data in a table or in a diagram. Here's an example of such a table. We want to make two products, fuel additive and solvent base. Now, um, the recipes for making these products are given here. To make one ton of fuel additive, we need to mix together 0.4 ton of material 1 and 0.6 ton of material 3. We have put those numbers right here uh, for the fuel additive column, 0.4 ton of material 1 and 0.6 ton of material 3. Now, a ton of solvent base uh, here uh, is a mixture of 0.5 ton of material 1, 0.2 ton of material 2, and 0.3 ton of material 3. And so there are the three values, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3, uh, that we have put in the second column uh, for the solvent base. Now, there are limited amounts of these materials 1, 2, and 3 as given by these values, 20 tons, 5 tons, and 21 tons, and we will put them in this column, uh, the amounts that are available uh, right here. Now, what other numbers are given? There's the $40 unit profit for the fuel additive and $30 unit profit for the solvent base. And that we could put in the bottom unit profit row, $40 per ton and $30 per ton. So that's all the data given. Now what is the question that is asked? Let's see, it says here, how many tons of fuel additive and how many tons of solvent base should be produced for the current period in order to maximize the total profit contribution? So the question is uh, right here. So that is the question. There are three steps in formulation of a linear programming model. We could see them here. So first you define your decision variables and then write down the objective function in terms of your decision variables. And the third, write down the constraints. We'll go through these three steps in detail. First, the decision variables. What are the quantities you're trying to decide on here? We're trying to decide on the tons of fuel additive and tons of solvent base to produce. So we give these guys names. Now typical variable names are like letters like X, Y, Z or maybe you might use X1, X2, X3 and so forth. But here uh, to make it easy to remember we're going to use the first letters of the two products. So F for fuel additive and S for solvent base. We're going to say let F be equal to the amount of fuel additive to produce and that's going to be we need to indicate the uh, the units so that's going to be in tons uh, and then we're going to say let s represent the amount and then we're going to say let s represent the amount of solvent base to produce again in tons. So that is the first step. Now before we proceed to the next steps, let's try to get a feel for this problem by trying some numbers. Just try plugging some trial values. Let's say for example we make uh, 20 tons of fuel additive and 10 tons of solvent base and let's see what kind of numbers we get. So try uh, F equal to 20 and S equal to 10. Now, can we make these quantities with the available materials here? Well, let's see. Hmm, we know that to make one ton of fuel additive, it says here we need to use 0.4 ton of material 1 and 0.6 ton of material 3. So, to make 20 tons of fuel additive, uh, here we need to use 0.4 times 20 tons of material 1 and 0.6 
times 20 tons of material 3. How about solvent base? To make 10 tons of solvent base, uh, here we could figure out we're going to need to 0.5 ton times 10 for material 1, 0.2 ton times 10, and 0.3 times 10. And these are the amounts that we'll need to use to make 10 tons of solvent base. So let's see, for the material 1, how much are we going to use? 0.4 times 20 is um, 8 tons for fuel additive. So 8 tons to make 20 tons of fuel additive. And then to make 10 tons of solvent base, we'll need to use 5 tons. So the total amount of material 1 that will be used is 8 plus 5, or 13. So here, the total amount we used will be 8 plus 5 is 13 for material 1. And uh, for material 2, it will be just 0.2 times 10 because there's nothing here. That's um, 2. So the amount used will be 2 here. And uh, material 3, uh, here we will need um, 12 tons to make 20 tons of fuel additive. Uh, then 3 tons to make 10 tons of solvent base. So it's 12 plus 3 is 15 tons will be used uh, of the material 3. Now the uh, it looks like the amounts that will be used are all within the limits of the available amount. So this is feasible. So it's possible to make these amounts with the available resources. So we have established that it's possible to make 20 tons of fuel additive and 10 tons of solvent base with the available materials. The next question might be, how much profit can we make from this? So what is the total profit from this might be the question. Well, the total profit should be the sum of the profits from the two products. So it would be, it would be profit from fuel additive plus profit from solvent base. Now here it says, if you make one ton of fuel additive, you make $40 in profit. So if you make 20 tons, uh, the profit that will be made will be just 40 times 20. So it's 40 times 20, it's 800. So $800 from the uh, fuel additive. Eight, so $800. Uh, then for the solvent base, $30 per ton. Uh, so if you make 10 tons, it's 30 times 10. It's 300. So that's 300 dollars from the solvent base and, and the total will be eleven hundred dollars. Now this gives us a feel for how to calculate uh, the profit and the uh, amounts of materials that are used. Uh, so now we're ready to go on to the second step. Second step is to come up with the objective function. Uh, so whatever you're trying to maximize or minimize, write that in terms of the your decision variables f and s. Uh, here we want to write down the total profit and how do we calculate the total profit here? It's profit from fuel additive plus profit from solvent base and that we got it from multiplying the unit profit by the amount of the you know fuel additive which is f and then multiplying the unit profit of thirty dollars by the amount of solvent base you know, which is s. So we just have to go 40 times F plus and then 30 times S. So the objective function we could say is we want to maximize uh, total profit uh, which is 40 times F plus 30 times S. The third step is to write down the constraints. Constraints are the restrictions on the values of F and S we know that we have limited materials, so F and S cannot be too large. For each material, we have limits on how much we could use. So we need to say, for each material, amount used must be no more than the amount available. 
Now the amounts available are given all uh, here, 25 and 21, and the amount that is used are, well, they were given here uh, just by plugging in these numbers, 20 and 10, but in general, uh, the amount used will be the sum of two amounts. The amount used to make fuel additive and then plus amount used to make solvent base. Oh, let's make a little correction here. Used. Now how do we get these numbers before? Uh, we multiply the given number 0.4 ton by the amount of fuel additive that was here. So that was like for material 1, you know, for, for material 1 it was 0.4 times F was over here and then for the solvent base it was 0.5 times the amount of the solvent base so it was here 0.5 times S and then we add them together and that gave us this number amount that is used so this is how we could get the amount used for each material so we just take the not given number times F plus the other given number times S. So we will say for material 1 the constraint is 0.4F plus 0.5S uh, less than or equal to the amount available 20 and then for material 2 we will do the same thing nothing here 0.2 times S is the amount used that should be less than or equal to 5. Then for material 3 is 0.6 times F plus 0.3 times S is less than or equal to 21. Let's write that down. 0.6F plus 0.3S less than or equal to 21. So these are the constraints from the limited materials. Now there is a one more constraint we need to specify. We need to tell the computer that we cannot make negative amounts of the products, those fuel additive or, or solvent base. Now, of course we know that, I mean you and I know uh, that you can't make negative amounts of anything but the computer doesn't know that so we need to make that an explicit constraint. So this is what we want to say. We want to say F should be greater than or equal to zero and S should be greater than or equal to zero. And the convention is to combine these constraints and just put them in one row. So we write it like this F comma S greater than or equal to zero. So we have written down the objective here and then the constraints here and that is our linear program model. Let me show you the completed version that appears in the Excel file. Here is a completed linear programming model. You could see here we would start with the word either maximize or minimize. So that is the first term that should appear in your linear programming model. Maximize, well, this time we want to maximize, sometimes we might minimize something. Uh, and then here you have your objective function. So that is your objective function. Now the descent variables are, you know, these F and S appearing everywhere. Uh, those are the descent variables. And then we have the constraints. So all these are your constraints. Let's write that down. And the last one here is a special constraint. It's a non-negativity uh, constraint. And um, the numbers here, like 25 and 21, uh, these are on the right-hand side of your constraint, so we call them right-hand side, or RHS for short, right-hand side values. Uh, and um, the other side, we're going to call these expressions for our convenience. We're going to call them left-hand side expressions to distinguish them from the right-hand side. 
notice all these are linear expressions. You got a coefficient times a variable, coefficient times a variable, and so forth. Now the values of f and s that satisfy all of the constraints at the same time are called feasible solutions. As it says uh, here, satisfies all the constraints. Uh, now, there are many possible feasible solutions. What we're looking for is the optimal solution. That is, out of all the feasible solutions, the best one. The best meaning, you know, the yielding the maximum profit or minimum cost, which, whichever is desired. In your textbook, it talks about how to use a graphical method to solve for the optimal solution. So they're talking about something like this. Basically, you draw something called a feasible region. So uh, the feasible region represents all the feasible solutions. And there's a mathematical theory that says to find the optimal solution, you know, the best one out of all these, you just need to look at the corner points, like right here, 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 and here of this feasible region. So you get the coordinates of the corners, and then calculate the profit at each corner by plugging the coordinates, and then take the one that has the highest profit. We're not actually going to use this method to find the optimal solution. This method is limited to problems with only two variables, you know, like f and s. But it's good to have some picture in mind. And uh, in the simplex method that the computer uses, uh, what it is doing is basically you know, looking at the corner points. To give you an idea, uh, here we have a preview of the Excel model. Uh, so here we have the possible solutions. So possible solution values F and S will go here. And here is a cell for the total profit. And then here are your constraints. Uh, except for the non-negativity constraint that's not shown here. So here you have the left-hand sides. These are going to go here. Right-hand sides, 25 and 21, are, are here. It's set up so that if you put in any numbers here, they show you the profit uh, and the corresponding left-hand sides of the constraints. So let's say uh, I try putting in the values we tried before, 20 for F and then 10 for the solvent base. You could see it gives you uh, $1,100 a total profit, and here are the amounts that are used. And from this, we could see that left-hand sides are all less than equal to the right-hand side, so this is a feasible solution. Another feasible solution might be, oh, how about zero and zero? You know, if you don't make anything, and then, of course, you make no profit, and you're not using any of the materials, so the used amounts are zero, and this will still be considered a feasible solution because it satisfies all these constraints. Now we might say, how about we try to make a, a higher profit? Before we tried 20 and 10, how about we try, uh, let's say, 25 and 15? Uh, then what? Well, total profit is more, 1450. And here we could see, oh, so the constraints are still satisfied. So this is still a feasible solution. Later we'll see how to use a solver to find the optimal solution here instead of us trying different values.